All right, so good morning and welcome to the Simons Institute. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett, I'm the Associate Director here. Uh, welcome to this uh, program on causality. I'm very excited to have it running this semester. Um, uh, for those of you that haven't been here before, we're a collaborative research institute in theoretical computer science. Uh, we've been funded since 2012 by the Simons Foundation, uh, at least in part, and uh, just in the last couple of years have had that funding renewed for another 10 years. So I'm very grateful to the Simons Foundation. We run these um, semester length programs, uh, typically two of them each, each semester. They bring a whole lot of visitors to the Berkeley campus um, this semester, we've, we've got causality and learning and games. So something like 175 long-term visitors here, uh, including uh, uh, 16 research fellows. So um, fantastic to have uh, all of that energy here. Um, a big thank you to the Sloan Foundation and the NSF through uh, FODSI for their support of, of these programs this semester. Um, the the boot camp uh, is a great start to these, these semester programs. It's um, you know, has a, a bit of an icebreaker role, um, gets program participants involved, gets people on the same page uh, in, in terms of the technical themes of the, of the program, and also has a lot of um, archival value. Uh, you know, the, the videos of the, the bootcamp talks are hugely popular on our um, YouTube uh, channel. Um, okay, a big, big thank you to the organizers of the Causality Bootcamp. Are also the uh, program organizers, uh, Frederick Eberhardt, who, who's here, uh, Kostas Daskalakis, Malus Mathus, Thomas Richardson, uh, Leonard Schulman, also here, and Caroline Ulas at the back over there. Um, thanks, thanks to all of those folks for putting together a great program for this week. Um, uh, so, uh, Frederick will say a few words about the, the themes of the boot camp in a moment, but let me let me mention some logistics first. Um, uh, you know, you're all wearing masks. We're required to wear them in the building. Uh, there's no food or drinks in the building. They're all um, kept outside. Um, uh, you've discovered the the food and drinks, no doubt. We have that at the breaks and. Uh, uh, except for lunchtime. So lunchtimes, you're on your own, um, lots of options uh, around campus and, and off campus. Um, if you'd like to leave things in lockers when you go to lunch, um, there are lockers on the far side of the building at this level uh, with, a, with a pin code, pretty convenient. Um, there's Wi-Fi access, no doubt you've discovered that, Cal Visitor and, and EduRome if, uh, if you have that. And all of our talks are live streamed and, and archived on YouTube and on our website uh, and, and also uh, accessible via Zoom. So, so people can ask questions online. Um, our videographer is Omid Farr in the booth, the booth back here. He's going to be helping with uh, speakers, connecting computers, providing microphones and so on. Um, and, and also uh, a big thank you to uh, Ashley Hassan, our events coordinator, who's managed the organization of the of the boot camp here. If you have questions, please ask Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. All right, I'll hand over to Frederick. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm Frederick Eberhardt. I'm one of the organizers of the causality program this term. Uh, on behalf of all the organizers, welcome to this program. I'm very excited to see this many people here in person. Two years ago, when uh, Peter and I were trying to think through how to do this sort of thing, uh, uh, the, the, how to build this program. I was sure that we would be safely past the pandemic. Well, uh, here we are still uh, working through it. Um, I still hope that we're going to have a lot of opportunity to interact in person, even under these conditions. So I'm really glad to see everyone here. I hope it will work out this way. For the boot camp, I'm very excited to have four speakers uh, over the week here. We're doing it a little different than previous boot camps have done it in that we've decided that we're going to let each speaker go for a whole day, basically, meaning, of course, four hours over spread over the day, not in one, one go all the way through. But the idea is to really allow one speaker to develop a little bit of theory more thoroughly rather than just have a one hour talk on something specific uh, uh, to their interest. The other part is that the boot camp is really there as an introduction to the topic. It's not the cutting edge research or anything like that. It's, it's an uh, attempt 
to get us all on the same page, to build some background together. And so many of you might have very advanced background on this already. Uh, others of you will be completely new to this. So the boot camp is supposed to get us onto the same page by giving a kind of introduction. Given that the Simons Institute is an institute for theoretical computer science, our thought was also to really integrate uh, uh, people from that sort of community into work and causality. And so I'm delighted that Spencer Gordon, who's uh, a PhD student in theoretical computer science, is giving the first uh, um, uh, presentation today or, or is giving the first day. That will, I hope, or at least that was the intention, allow us to start looking at the causality work from that perspective, I think, and see how people from theoretical computer science might work their way into this sort of material. The following days, we're looking at causal discovery tomorrow with Dan Malinsky, who I think is somewhere here as well. Uh, and um, uh, then Thomas Richardson will talk about potential outcomes on Thursday and on Friday, Chandler Squires is going to talk about experimental design. Of course, that's not all of causality. We have, we have to choose and we have to select, we have to decide on what sort of topics we're going to cover. It's going to be a biased introduction to uh, causality but uh, uh, we only had four days and we thought that over those four days, we want to develop something uh, real on each day. In any case, let's get started. Uh, please welcome Spencer Gordon. He's a PhD student at Caltech working with Leonard Schulman and he'll do the first day on introduction to causal graphical models. Spencer, thanks. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, hi, welcome to the Causality Bootcamp first day. Uh, I'm going to be talking about causal graphical models. Uh, the first thing to mention is there's a handout uh, to accompany this talk with everything I'm going to say in a lot more detail. Um, it's available at that URL. Uh, feel free to follow along. Um, but uh, hopefully, I should be more interesting than reading the handout. Um, we'll see. Um, okay, so the uh, let's get started. Um, so here's the table of contents. Uh, we're going to start with an introduction and then spend a lot of time talking about Bayesian networks and then finally turn to causal uh, inference specific stuff uh, later in the day, uh, mostly after lunch. Um, I'll have a little bit more to say about this after an introduction, but um, let's set up the sorts of things we're interested in. Um, so first of all, we're gonna take the viewpoint that all causal, uh, all, all causality is probabilistic. Take something that's kind of like the canonical uh, sort of causal statement that, um, people would agree with um, all over the world. Uh, smoking causes lung cancer, everyone agrees. But of course, this is not a deterministic fact. You know, There's no set amount of cigarettes where if you smoke this many cigarettes for this long, you're guaranteed to get lung cancer. The best you can say is that you know, a certain amount of smoking has some likelihood of causing lung cancer or increases the probability that you're gonna get lung cancer or something like that. So we're gonna treat causality as inherently probabilistic, uh, even if only because we don't have enough information to say something deterministic. Um, so yeah, we'll use probabilities to capture uncertainty and indeterminacy. Um, and in particular, we're going to be interested in what are called probabilistic causal models. This is um, a pretty nice, clean framework for thinking about causality. Uh, we're going to do a bunch of reasoning in that setting, um, but we're mostly going to prove things about uh, Bayesian networks, in particular Bayesian networks with a causal interpretation. These are like the shadows of the probabilistic causal model. This is kind of a representation of the limited information you get uh, because you don't know everything in the, probable, 
in the probabilistic causal model. Um, okay, so what is a probabilistic causal model? It is a tuple of four things. First, we have a set of background random variables u, and these are exogenous random variables. We can't observe them. We can't manipulate them. They're just out there. This is the only source of randomness in our model. Um, we're going to have a set of observable variables. Um, this is what we're going to be uh, interested in understanding cause and effect in. We're not going to uh, be able to say anything about these uh, background random variables u. Um, and we're going to think of each of these observable variables as taking on a value by a deterministic function of some of the other observable random variables and some of the background random variables. So our model also contains a collection of functions, one for each observable that takes some of the random, some of the u variables and some of the other observables and produces the value for xi. Um, and then to fully specify the model, we need a joint distribution over the, the hidden random variables, the u. Um, and so once I've um, told you the distribution over u and I've given you the functions that compute all the x's as uh, based on the values of prior x's and, and the u, then you get a distribution on the observable random variables. Um, and you should think of uh, you, uh, you should think of this distribution P of V as being the only thing you'd actually get access to. And um, in a, well, I'll have more to say about this later. Um, uh, so how do you compute this? You can just, uh, for each value of U, compute the, uh, or you can, once I specify an assignment to all the U, then I can just run through and compute all the Xs. Um, so I can compute the joint distribution over all the observables by marginalizing out the U. Um, let's make this more concrete with an example. Um, okay, so the details of this example are not important. The point is just to get a flavor of what these sorts of models look like. But uh, for the sake of concreteness, let's say we have five hidden random variables, u1 through u5. We'll have five observable variables, x1 through x5. I'll give the, the functions uh, that determine the values of the x's below. Um, but I want to specify the distribution over the hidden random variables. So I'll say that all the ui are independent. Um, and u1 is going to be uniform over the seasons, winter, spring, summer, or fall. The other UIs are just going to be negative, take on values negative one, zero, one. Um, and they'll represent a system, kind of boring system, in which we have variables for the season, whether it's raining or not, whether the sprinkler's on or off, whether uh, the sidewalk is wet, and whether the sidewalk is slippery. And so you could imagine that once I uh, tell you the season, I can determine whether it's or there's some distribution on whether it's raining that's determined just by the season. So maybe if it's winter or fall, then it's more likely to be raining. And I can use this U2 variable, which has some distribution that I didn't write down because the details, again, are not important to you know, change the probability of rain. Uh, it's just some independent way of manipulating the rain random variable. And then I have a sprinkler. And maybe I only put the sprinkler on in the summer or, or the spring. but uh, you know, maybe U3 equaling one, that corresponds to, well, maybe you, uh, there's a typo here. Anyway, uh, the point is you can compute the values of each of these X's by looking at the values of the prior X's and some subset of the random variables. So this is not particularly easy to understand. Um, and uh, that's why, we like to look at graphs. So we can represent a system like this with a graph, the induced graph of the model. And uh, the graph is constructed as follows. You have a vertex for each of your observable random variables, and you have an edge x to y if the function that computes y 
takes x as an input. And so in this case, the rain random variable is determined only by the season and then some of the hidden variables. The sprinkler is only determined by the season and some of the hidden random variables. But you know, the sprinkler doesn't take as input any of the variables below and rain doesn't take the sprinkler's input, sprinkler doesn't take rain as input. Um, so one thing to get out of the way is in the definition I gave, I forced these graphs to be acyclic because I said xi could only depend on x1 through xi minus one. In general, you could imagine relaxing that restriction and there are reasons you might be interested in that, but throughout today, we're only gonna be interested in these acyclic probabilistic causal models. Um, and what about confounders? So none of the U variables are represented on this in this diagram. Um, and so what happens if I have a single background random, random variable that affects multiple observables? Well, I need to then uh, preserve that information in this diagram. And so I add a bi-directed edge. So if, there's, if f of x and f of y both take some u variable as an argument, we'll add an edge to this diagram, which will draw this dashed line with two arrowheads, but it just mean, which is just shorthand for uh, the existence of some other vertex that happens to be hidden, which uh, is used to determine both x and y. Uh, okay, another thing to note is um, without confounders, um, the distribution induced by describing distribution over the uh, hidden variables factors according to this graph, by which I mean you can compute the, or you can write the joint distribution as the product of a bunch of terms, conditional probability distributions where each term corresponds to some variable conditioned on its parents. So this is gonna be very important in what follows and I'll explain the relationship in more detail later, but it's worth noting right now that once you have this graph, you also get this nice representation. Um, so why are these called causal models? Um, because you can represent uh, interventions in these graphs and ask causal questions. So what would it mean to, sorry, I said, you can represent interventions in these models and ask causal questions. So what would an intervention uh, look like? Well, uh, imagine this very boring system again. Uh, I could, I might wanna ask like, what happens if I turn the sprinkler on or off? What does that do to whether the sidewalk is wet or slippery? So, and the way to, that we're gonna model that sort of a question is um, asking that question is like asking what happens if I change the mechanism by which the sprinkler is on or off is determined if I change that mechanism to a mechanism, a new mechanism that's just a constant. So if I wanna model the intervention of turning the sprinkler off, I basically rip out the equation that determines x3 as a function of x2, x1, and some random variables, and I just replace it with the constant uh, off. And so once I do that, that changes the graph corresponding to this model, and this changes the distribution um, over the observable random variables. And we're gonna write um, P sub X of V for the distribution we get when we intervene and set some random variable X to the value little x. So uh, one convention that I should note early on is we're going to use capital letters for random variables and lowercase letters for assignments to those random variables. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit, this convention is gonna fall apart a little bit, but hopefully it should be mostly clear. Uh, and in general, if you see an uppercase letter, it's a random variable, a lowercase letter is the corresponding, is an assignment to that random variable. So let's look at the graph that we get when we do this intervention. So we force the sprinkler to be off. Uh, in the induced graph, we've replaced the function f of x three, with a new function that doesn't depend on x1. So we've deleted the edge from x1 to x3. And 
what does this do to the joint distribution? Well, now, if I look at some assignment to all the variables that is consistent with the intervention, uh, in particular, that means in which X3 is set to off. Well, we can compute the probability of that as follows by using the factorization that corresponds to this graph. So we'll have a term for X1 and then a term for X2 given X1. And then we won't have a term for X3 because uh, that's tri trivially set to off. And then in all the terms that depend on X3, we won't plug in an arbitrary value of X3, we'll just plug in the fixed value of X3 at all. Uh, I should have said this earlier, but please stop me if you have questions. Um, Frederick will make sure that they don't take up too much time. So don't worry about that when asking questions. Yeah. 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 So uh, for those listening uh, elsewhere, the question was when I say that the induced graph changes, when I do an intervention, the only thing that changes is going to be the edges into the variables that I intervene on. So in general, we'll think of interventions. You can apply them to multiple variables at the same time. And then any edges into any of those variables will get deleted. But but yeah, that, that, that's the only sort of change that an intervention will cause. Um, OK, and so another thing to note is um, we can compute this interventional distribution, uh, in this case, from the observed distribution alone. Right? This factorization doesn't contain any terms that explicitly refer to u. So if we had the observed distribution alone and the factorization for the observed distribution, then uh, we could compute this interventional distribution. Um, this will not always be the case. So let's look at the simplest sort of example in which this is not the case. So here we have two observables, x and y, and some uh, u that is the, upon which both x and y depend. Um, so again, just to remind you, this picture is exactly the same thing as this picture. Um, and so how would we write the interventional distribution in this case? Uh, well, we'd get it by taking the joint distribution uh, and then marginalizing out u. But uh, when we do that, we'll have this term, but well, we'll have two terms that explicitly refer to u. Um, and so if we don't have access to the distribution over u, we can't compute this. Um, and so again, the reason that we get this expression is that after we do the intervention, the induced graph is going to be of this form. We've deleted the u to x edge. Since u no longer influences x, we fixed x. Um, but u still influences y. And so we still, want to, we still have to compute y given x and u. Um, So again, the, the point I'm the point, the key point to take away from this example is knowing the distribution over the observed variables alone is not sufficient to compute the interventional distribution. Uh, let's look at a slightly modified example. So you might think that this example uh, is similar. We have a variable u that talks to both x and y. Uh, can we compute the distribution on y when we intervene on x? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, so it turns out in this case, unlike the previous case, we can compute the interventional distribution that we get when we intervene on x. In, in particular, we can compute the distribution on y in the modified, uh, when we inter intervene on x. And we can do this without knowing the distribution over hidden random variables. So how would we do this? Well, we would uh, look at the joint distribution over it after post-intervention on y, z, and u. We'd marginalize out z and u. And it turns out with some algebra um, that you can eventually get this to a form that doesn't depend on u. So in particular, we have this p of z given x term doesn't uh, depend on u. We can pull it outside the summation. And then uh, by the law of total probability, 
these two terms will combine and we'll get rid of the, the U here. And so it turns out the final interventional distribution is just the product of these two terms of X given Z given X and then of Y given Z. Um, so this may be kind of surprising, maybe not. Um, so in the, sorry. Some over z in that. Yes, sorry. I, I yeah, thank you. I dropped uh, the summation over z. I do need the summation over z here. That's right. My goal is to marginalize out z. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so another thing to note is if you have an expression of this form that is an expression that doesn't refer to you. Um, and you've computed it via correct manipulations of probabilities. You've also you also have a proof that the observational distribution determine uniquely determines the interventional distribution in any causal model that induces that graph. Um, and in this case, we'll, we say that the interventional distribution is identifiable. Um, I'll go into more detail into this. Uh, and define this a little more precisely later, but uh, for now, identifiability means observational distribution is sufficient to determine the interventional distribution. Sorry, could you clarify the difference between this example and the previous one? Um, so, in terms of the graph, the, the difference is the presence of this intermediate variable z, which does not depend on you. Um, as for why this allows you to compute the interventional distribution, um, I'll have a answer in the afternoon, but a lot of today will be spent in developing the theory that we need to be able to prove that we can compute this interventional distribution and we can't in the, the prior example. Um, so this is sort of the motivating question for today. Like how can you distinguish between these two cases? And if I give you a situation where, we, where the interventional distribution is identifiable, can you give me the, the formula that expresses it as a function of the observational distribution? Yeah? Sorry, I think I'm missing something. What comes from setting Z to have like the identity map to X? It is like, could we just reduce this to the other one? Is that just be exactly the same X? Um, okay, so the, the question was. Uh, well, correct me if I'm phrasing this incorrectly, but the question, or one way of looking at the question is, what if the function that realized z is uh, from x was the identity map, then doesn't this reduce to uh, the previous model? And the answer is um, yes, in the sense that uh, you can realize any distribution consistent with the, or you could, any distribution that was consistent with the previous model could exist in this model, but you get this additional information. You get to observe this Z in this model, which is, you know, is not depend, which you know is not determined by you, or at least does not directly, is not directly influenced by you. So that's, the additional information you get in this model that allows you to uh, do more. Yeah. So sorry to jump ahead, but um, in this graph, there's a back door right from x to y. So shouldn't this just be unidentifiable? Like we can't, you know what I mean? If you can't close this back door through you, then there's no way to identify the effect of x on y. And similarly, like in the previous example where it's the X directly affecting Y, in a concrete scenario, you could imagine just identifying some mediating variable Z, inserting it, and then you'd always be able to identify the you know, effect of X on Y. Um, so I, I guess, uh, and mathematically, like is it this term P Z given X that should not be able to come out of the sum? Because we're summing over Z. So. Your first thing again, there should be a sum summation over z here. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so this is just incorrect as written. 
imagine a sigma z outside of this. Um, I, I don't know if like this is meant to you're trying to relate this to like instrumental variables or something, but like the, the graph is slightly different in that case. Like the u would point to z and x would be the instrument, but yeah, so I I'm not sure I have enough knowledge of uh instrumental variables to say anything intelligent about that. Um so the only difference with that is that the graph would have u pointing to z and not to x, and then x is free of u. But because x is not free of u here, and there's this unobserved class like through u, it shouldn't be possible to identify the second class. So the concern for those listening is that it shouldn't be possible to identify this effect because of this uh, half between uh, or from x to y via u. Um, I claim that this is a proof that it is identifiable, modulo the incorrect lack of summation. Uh, so, if so, the question is whether or not you believe this proof. Uh, let me try to address your question later today. Uh, if this isn't, I'm not sure I have all that much to say about it without developing some more theory. Uh, uh, Spencer, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is this is Thomas Richardson. I, I just have a quick question about your last simplification, where you go from the sum over u to p of u, p of y, given z and u, mm -hmm. because u is not independent of z. So it's not clear to me how you're able to do that last step, because u is only independent of z after intervention, not in the original observed distribution. So I, I don't think that last simplification is right. Um, even with the sum over z, even with the sum over z added, I still think that last simplification from the second last line to the last line. I don't think those two expressions are equal. Uh, I believe they are just by the law of total probability. If I sum over all values of u, I should be able to eliminate the u. Uh, you, 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 would, you would need u given z there. P of u given z, p of y given z and u. Uh, let me assume, let me, I would need to write this down to, to, to verify this. Let me check things over later and get back to you. Uh, if I'm convinced you're correct, uh, for the sake okay, of time, okay. I'm, I'm going to move on. I just now. want to be clear that, that the identifying expression you've got there is not, this is the front door model. And that is not the identifying expression for the front door model, even with the sum over Z. So just want to be clear about it. Okay. At some point later, I will replace this with a corrected slide that uh, hopefully we'll all be able to agree is in fact correct. Uh, let me move on for the time being and I'll stop for questions in a bit. Um, okay. So here's the big picture for today. Um, there exists an algorithm that takes a graph induced by a causal model, a distribution over the observable variables for that model, and a target intervention. We want to intervene on variables x and look at the effect on variables y. And it will return a formula for the interventional distribution on y when you intervene on x, if it's identifiable from the observables. And if it's not, it will return a proof that it's not identifiable. So our goal for uh, today is to get to the, um, to being able to understand this result, uh, not in full detail, but at least the, the basic outline of the result. Um, I should note that this is not the only uh, algorithm for solving this problem. There are other algorithms. I chose this one because it's the one I understand best. And it's relatively simple as far as these things go. Um, um, OK, so the agenda, we want to understand the relationship between DAGs and distributions that factor over those DAGs. Then we're going to address the question, when do two DAGs induce the same or correspond to the same set of possible distributions? Um, then we're going to look at what conditional independencies are implied by a DAG. And, and then we'll go into the do calculus, which is a set of rules for manipulating interventional distributions. And then finally, we'll look at the spitzer perl ID algorithm. Um, sorry, uh, I think there was a question over there. Yes. Yeah. So. Just because I'm a beginner in that stuff, I would like to understand something. If you give me a graph, can you a, a very can you give me a very simple graph and explain me why there are at least 
two causally different models. Because I remember in your in your phrase that you say uh, about the identifiability that uh, that means that for any causal model that can be induced by this graph. So can you give me a graph and two causal models that are induced by this graph? Yeah. Just um, understand simply sure. what you mean. Yeah. So the question is like in, in the case where something's not identifiable, like what does that look like? So let me go back to the example that I claimed was not identifiable. So here's a causal model in which, or here, here are two causal models uh, in which the observable distributions are the same and the interventional distributions are uh, different. So imagine first that u is uniform between zero and one, and then x just takes on the same value as u, and then y just takes on the same value as u. So here you see that x equals y with probability one, um, and yet intervening on x and setting x to one or zero has no impact whatsoever on y um, because y just gets its value based on u. So it's a little bit, it's cheating in the sense that y actually doesn't depend on x in some sense, but uh, it's still consistent with the edges in this graph. So the other model is u doesn't do anything. X is just, uh, or sorry, u is uniformly zero or one and then u doesn't actually influence y directly. Y just takes on, and x just takes on the value that u does, and then y just takes on the value that x does. So in that model, intervening on x would cause y to, whatever you set x to, y will take on that value with probability one. Uh, so in one model, intervening on x does nothing. In the other model, intervening on x deterministically sets y equal to x. Yeah? Excellent, I got it. Now my question is the following. In your last uh, example, where you say y equals actually x and x just uh, gets the value by u, uh, uh, why, there is, uh, uh, why there is a dust line between u and y? Because it is not clear that they have in... Do you see what I am saying? That... Um, I don't, let me... Come, let me come back to it later. Uh, if you still have the question, I'm a little bit worried about time. But, uh, Maybe just to say the edges allow influence, they don't require it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, sorry. The, the concern was in one of in one of the two models I've described, u doesn't actually do anything to y. That's okay because yeah, the edge just means I have a function like there, that y can be expressed as a function of x and u. And one function of x and u is the function that just ignores u. It is cheating in the sense that, yeah, you, you might want an example in which u still somehow is, in, is used in the function. Um, but uh, this is, that would be allowable under this. Uh, yeah, that is consistent with everything I've described to not actually have a variable depend on all the values that the function determining it takes as arguments. It can just ignore arguments, that's fine. Just to clarify, you're using sums everywhere and all your examples are discrete. This, this works entirely fine with continuous variables, right? Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, I'm using sums everywhere and all of my examples are discrete. Does this work for continuous variables? And yes, with some slight modifications, uh, but basically, everything just carries through with continuous variables. Um, um, okay, uh, so that was the big picture. Our goal is to work up to the Spitzer Perl ID algorithm, and we're going to have to do a whole bunch of stuff to get there. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is look at Bayesian networks. Um, okay, so. Uh, sorry, there are a couple of preliminaries. Um, so let's just uh, remind ourselves of the definition of conditional independence. So we say that two random variables are independent, condition on Z if for all assignments to the random variables. So we'll use D sub random variable for the domain of the random variable for discrete random variables, just the support. Um, so for all values that X can take on, Y can take on, and Z can take on, 
the probability of X given Y and Z should be equal to the probability of X given Z whenever Y, uh, the joint is, whenever the probability of Y and Z is non-zero. Alternatively, uh, we can express the condition as follows. The probability of X and Y given Z should be factorable into a term probability of X given Z times the probability of Y given Z. And if this is the case, we write that X and Y are, well, we write this expression with a double turnstile and we pronounce this X and Y are conditionally independent given Z in the distribution P. Um, this subscript P is quite important. It looks at the moment like it's superfluous. Uh, we'll often be dealing with multiple distributions at a time, and it'll be important to distinguish conditional independence in one distribution from conditional independence in a different distribution. We'll also have a modified piece of notation uh, corresponding to graphs. So the only thing I, I want you to uh, take away from this point is just pay attention to the subscript. Um, okay, uh, and some concepts from uh, graph theory that we're going to need. Um, so this is a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. Um, we're going to often talk about directed paths in a DAG. So a directed path is a sequence of distinct vertices. Uh, each, of, uh, each consecutive pair of vertices in it is adjacent via an edge that points, at, via edges that all point in the same direction. So this is an example, A to B to E to F to G. It's a directed path. Um, and we'll use this notation occasionally uh, as a, the proposition that there exists a directed path between A and G, or to refer to a, we'll write something on top of the arrow to refer to a specific directed path between A and G. Um, so the next notion we'll need is a trail. So a trail in a directed graph for our purposes will be a sequence of distinct vertices that are adjacent via edges in either direction. So here we take an edge from D to B where the edge points towards D. And then we take an edge from B to E where the edge points away from D and when you lay it out like this. Um, so this is an example of a trail and we'll use this funny notation for the proposition that there exists a trail between D and C in a given graph. It's a squiggly line with two circles on the end. This is the circles on the end are intended to indicate that we don't know the orientation of the edges in the trail. Um, okay, so the next concept we'll need is that of parents. So the parents of a vertex or a set of vertices is just all the, the uh, vertices in uh, for which there's a edge into the set. So the parents of F are E and C because E and C have a direct edge into F. And then ancestors, the ancestors is the closure of uh, the parent relationship. It's all the things you can get by taking parents of parents of parents of parents any number of times, including zero times. So it's everything, uh, that the ancestors of a set just all the vertices for which there's a directed edge or directed path into the set. So there's a directed path from A to F in this graph. So A is an ancestor of F. There's a directed path of length zero from F to F. So F is its own ancestor. Um, and then similarly, we have children and descendants. And again, descendants contain the set of descendants of a set include the set itself. Um, so another concept that will be important is that of an upward closed set. So this is also known as an ancestral set elsewhere. It's just a set of vertices in a DAG uh, that contains its own ancestors. So if I look at the ancestors of anything in A, B, C, or D, it's also our, the ancestors of A, B, C, and D are just A, B, C, and D themselves. So this is an ancestral or upward closed set. I'll try to be consistent and talk about upwards closed sets, but I may slip up and uh, talk about ancestral sets at some point. But, uh. 
And finally, we'll need to talk about induced subgraphs. So the induced subgraph. Uh, uh, so if I have if I, if I have a graph G and some subset of the vertices, the induced subgraph on those on that vertex set is just the graph I get uh, when I remove all the vertices outside the set and remove all the edges uh, outside the set and just keep the vertices in the set and all the edges between them. Um, okay. An arrow from B to B to F. Uh, from B to F. I don't think so. There has never been an arrow. No, oh, no, no, for the for the induced subgraph. So I don't add uh, any edges that are not present in the original graph. It's just the restriction of the original graph to things, uh, to to edges and vertices, exclusively contained within this set. Um, there could be other errors, but I don't think so. Um, okay, so now we come to Bayesian networks. So what is a Bayesian network? It's a DAG along with a distribution on that DAG that factors according to that DAG, by which I mean the joint distribution over all the vertices on that DAG can be written as the product of terms of the form probability of some X given its parents. So we're going to take this to be the definition of, the Bayes of a Bayesian network, and we're going to provide some alternative characterizations in a minute. Um, so we'll often be interested in the question of, is a given distribution, can it be factored according to a graph? And if it can, by which I mean its factorization looks like this, or it has a factor. It can be factored like this, then we'll say that uh, the distribution is compatible with the graph G, or occasionally we'll say P is Markov relative to the graph G. I tend to prefer the compatibility uh, terminology, but I may at some point just switch to the other for no particular reason. Um, uh, and we'll write uh, math cal. P of G for the set of distributions consistent or compatible with G. Um, okay, so let's prove something pretty easy. So if I have an upwards closed set and a distribution that's compatible with G, then we can write the joint distribution over the set S as, or we can express that by writing the joint distribution over everything, and marginalizing out um, the vertices not in S. And then we're left with a product of the terms corresponding to the vertices in S. And so we get that the joint distribution over S is compatible with the graph, the, the induced subgraph on S. Um, and another uh, result in this vein, the conditional distribution on everything but S given S is compatible with the graph, the induced subgraph on everything but S. Um, so this is an example of how you can uh, get some pretty powerful conclusions from just this factorization alone. Um, uh, Let's turn to some alternative characterizations, which will prove, um, which are often more useful. Okay. So, um, so the first characterization that we'll want to prove is the following. P is compatible with the graph G if in any topological ordering of the vertices X1 through Xn, each xi is independent of its predecessors given its parents. Um, so another way of writing that is oh, using the notation that I introduced already. This is the same thing as xi is conditionally independent of x1 given
So let's try and prove this characterization. Um, so let's first start with the forward direction. So assume P is compatible with G. Um, then fix some topological ordering on the vertices. Um, so now we can look at the joint distribution over X1 through XI and the joint distribution of X1 through XI minus one. Now the first, in a topological ordering, the first I vertices are an upward closed set. There are no predecessors to those vertices that are not included in this set. Um, so this is just the product of uh, a at most i and then this is just the product Sorry, this should be an XJ. Uh, so the joint distribution over the first I vertices is just the product of the terms corresponding to the first I vertices. The joint distribution over the first I minus one is the product of the first I minus one. And so the conditional probability um, of XI given x1 through xi minus one is just the ratio of uh, this term over this term. And so all the terms in these two products are gonna cancel out except for the term corresponding to E of uh, xi given parents of xi. And so by the first characterization of conditional probability, this is a proof that if P is compatible with G, then in any topological ordering, each XI is independent of its predecessors given its parents. Yes. Um, could you remind me what a topological ordering is and yes. how that depends on the graph G? Yeah. So I probably should have defined that explicitly. So what is a topological ordering? Um, a topological ordering of a graph uh, or of the vertices in a graph is just some ordering of the vertices, some enumeration of the, ver the vertices in the graph that is consistent with the predecessor relationship. So that means uh, no vertex should appear uh, after any of its predecessors. Um, and that's pretty much the only constraint, word. sorry, but after its ancestors. Great, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, please. Do stop me if I've failed to define anything else important. Uh, um, okay, so what about the other direction? If uh, P is, or sorry, if in any topological ordering, each XI is independent of its predecessors given its parents, uh, how do we know that P is compatible with G? Um, well, just write out the joint distribution using the chain rule. So um, Sorry, I just assumed what I intended to prove. So I can do this for any joint distribution. And then the assumption that each XI is independent of its predecessors given its parents means that I can replace 
each of these terms with um, E of XJ given the parents of XJ. So that suffices to prove this ordered Markov condition. One thing to note is we didn't actually need the full strength of in any topological ordering. Uh, each XI is independent of its predecessors. It's sufficient to know that there's one topological ordering in which that's the case. And then we can conclude that P is compatible with G. Is there a question? Mm -hmm. What's the point of this? Is to show what would be statistically true if it's that as a correct problem. Um, the question is, what's the point of this condition? Uh, like you should observe this in your data if this is a correct problem. I'm not sure I can give you an explanation outside of just developing the theory here. It, it turns out to be useful. Uh, sometimes to explicitly construct a distribution that by giving a topological ordering and then uh, showing that each XI is independent of its predecessors given its parents, and then you get that P is compatible with G. Uh, yeah, my explanation is only the only answer I have for why this is useful. Uh, at the moment is we're going to use it in subsequent proofs. Um, yeah. So another characterization, um, the parental Markov condition. So it's also the case that P is compatible with G if and only if each X is independent of its non-descendants given its parents. Um, so I won't bother to write anything down because it's very straightforward. So. How do we prove this? Well, let's say P is compatible with G. Then we can appeal to the ordered Markov condition and uh, pick a topological order in which all of X's non-descendants come before X. And then just apply the conclusion here, X is, and to get that X is independent of its non-descendants given its parents. And for the other direction, if each X is independent of its non-descendants, then um, fix some topological order. Uh, and then the non-descendants of X include all of its predecessors. So it's an immediate consequence of this. Um, sorry, that was a bit brief, but uh, it's a worthwhile exercise to do it in more detail if you haven't seen this before. Um, so I think we're going to finish this segment with a nice lemma that uh, will be used quite a bit later, um, which is the following. So uh, the way I like to think about it is we, if we're given it, well, I'll just read it and then I'll interpret it. So fix some graph and three sets, X, Y, and Z. And if all the common ancestors of X and Y are contained within Z, then, and the ancestors of Z are contained within Z, so this is exactly the definition of upwards closed, then X and Y are conditionally independent given Z. Um, in any distribution, P compatible with that graph. So the picture you want to have in mind is here's our graph and the up to down direction will roughly correspond to uh, the predecessor or the, the parent child relationship. So here's our set X, here's our set Y and the ancestors of X, maybe it looks like this. The ancestors of Y, maybe it looks like this. And Z is some set that's closed under ancestor, under the ancestor relationship that includes all the common ancestors of X and Y, then conditioning on Z eliminates any dependence between X and Y. And so X and Y are conditionally independent given Z. Um, so let's prove this. 
Um, so we're going to use this uh, little lemma that, or this observation that I stated and didn't prove that um, the distribution P of V minus Z given Z is compatible with G of the, the induced subgraph on V minus Z given Z. So under this assumption, or assuming this observation, we can write, uh, well, well, we'll use this observation along with the following definition. So let X prime be the ancestors of X minus Z. Let Y prime be the ancestors of Y minus Z. So that is X prime is this set. Y prime is this set. Um, so in the graph, the induced subgraph on V minus Z, induced by uh, conditioning on, sorry, this notation is incorrect, but I meant to write the following. So the observation gives us that the distribution on the remaining vertices given Z is compatible with the induced subgraph on the remaining vertices. Now in this induced subgraph, X prime and Y prime are upwards closed. And in particular, their union is upwards closed. So I can write the, prop, the distribution on X prime and Y prime given Z using this compatibility as the product over, uh, I need another variable name, W in X prime union Y prime. Sorry, is this not, is this visible or is it too low? Uh, it's about as low as you can go, I think. Okay. Um, I'm blocking everything with this picture. Um, okay, so let me transcribe this formula a little bit higher up. So, I think there's another board done right here. Um, I, I won't need much more space for, for right now. I'll figure something else out for later. But uh, the joint distribution on X prime and Y prime given Z can be written as the product of terms, uh, each of which is the form some variable given its parents, uh, just containing variables in this set. So uh, so in sorry, I'm decomposing this distribution into terms. Uh, for just X prime and Y prime. And I'm using this observation that their union is upwards closed. So the joint distribution on X prime and Y prime in this conditional distribution here factors as such. And then if I just pull apart the terms corresponding to X prime and the terms corresponding to Y prime, I get that this is equal to the probability of X prime given Z times the probability of Y prime given Z. Um, and uh, then I can just marginalize out by the variables in X prime or Y prime that are not in X or Y, right? So the thing I wanted to show was that the joint distribution over X and Y given Z is equal to the probability of X given Z 
times the probability of y given z, which is implied by this uh, larger conditional independence. Um, okay, so uh, hopefully that wasn't too surprising, but uh, we've now shown this nice lemma, which we'll use, I think, in the next session. Um, this much time. Okay, and I think that's it for right now. Uh, and I guess we'll continue after a break. Right. So I guess we're reconvening that. And uh, 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 I'll have the bell and call everyone. If the questions are coming in, on, I see questions coming in from you, some chat session on the screen. Yeah, I, I don't know. I would have to log into those. Thank you.